Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word. We thank you for the truth. Thank you for the revelation you're bringing this night. Thank you for us being established in it. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated if you would. Tonight we are going to discuss a doctrinal subject and talk to you about the subject of the triunity of the Godhead. You'll see why we call it the triunity of the Godhead shortly. First we begin in Deuteronomy 6 verse 4. This is Israel's great confession. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Well, they consider him just one Lord. Well, we got to look and see who God is in the scripture. Is God one? What does it mean if it says one? Does it mean one person only? Or does it mean one in unity, perhaps with other persons of the Godhead? If God is one, is there one person or is there, is there a plurality of persons? We must answer that, and the scriptures will show this clearly. You will see that there is a plurality of the persons of, in the Godhead. Cults teach that there's only one God, and they deny three persons of the Godhead. The Jews teach that there's only one God, and they deny the three persons of the Godhead as well. They don't believe that Jesus is God whatsoever. And their Pentecostal groups, known as Oneness, Apostolic Pentecostals, that say that there's only one God, and they call him Jesus, and they say that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are titles or manifestations of Jesus. They deny the three persons of the Godhead. They are a cult. Anybody who denies the Father and the Son is, does not, is not having God, according to 2 John verse 9. Now, the other problem we see is then Christians who have believed in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, they call this the Trinity. Everybody calls it the Trinity out there. It is not the Trinity, because Trinity means three. Are we talking about three gods? No. We're talking about one God. And there are three persons in the Godhead, as you will see. And the scriptures make it clear. We must understand there is a oneness aspect of God in the fact that he is one. And we need to understand that and we will see that. Because the word says so. The Lord our God is one Lord. Well, that's a true statement. Remember, every scripture is true. And we can't just throw, ignore what scriptures say. So the statement that, it, that the Trinity is wrong. It is contrary to the Word of God, as you will see. First of all, we must realize that how are we going to know things? We're going to look at the Word. The Word is the truth. We know that from over in John chapter 17. It means we can't be looking at other sources to come up with anything. John 17, verse 17, Sanctify them through thy word, truth. The word, thy Word is truth. And we also know that the Holy Spirit will lead us and guide us and bring us revelation of His ways. We know from John 14, verse 26, the Comforter who is the Holy Ghost whom the Father will send in my name, He will teach you all things. So He'll teach us all things in the truth about God. We also see in chapter 16, verse 13, speaking of what the Holy Spirit will do, how be it when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth. We can know all truth. There should not be a separation of belief regarding the Word of God if people have truly been taught by the Holy Spirit and guided into all truth, which is what should happen. Of course, we've got to look at all the scriptures on a subject, and we can't take certain scriptures and make a doctrine out of them without looking at and examining all the rest of the scriptures. Well, that means there's got to be some diligent study. 2 Timothy chapter 2 Verse 15, study, and remember we've looked at this word before, it doesn't mean study actually, it is the word be diligent. And so we're going to be diligent in two different aspects it speaks here of the workman that needeth not be ashamed and rightly dividing the word of truth. So the aspect of studying does come into play to be able to rightly divide the word of truth. So we're going to be diligent to show ourselves approved unto God 
A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, because we're going to carry out the work of God in our life. And we're also going to rightly divide the word of truth because we are going to study the word of God. So well, that means that we also must not approach the word again with preconceived beliefs. You can't believe, I've always believed such and such. Well, you might be wrong, you might be right. I've always believed it's a trinity because everybody has taught, taught me it's the trinity. Well, you may be wrong, you may be right. right. You've got to check it out and find out if it's true. Because Trinity means three gods. We've got to look at all these things. So we're going to look at the scriptures. And first of all, we go over to Acts chapter 17. We call this the triunity of the Godhead. Well, is there something about there being a Godhead? Uh, yes, there is. Acts 17 verse 29 says, For as much then as we're the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is likened to gold, silver, or stone, graven by art or man's device. So there is the Godhead, as the scripture points out. We see it in another place, Romans chapter 1, verse 20. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. This is why nobody has any excuse for believing in God. Being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Nobody has any excuse whatsoever. And then we see another place where it speaks about the Godhead over in Colossians chapter 2, verse 9. It says this, For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Here it speaks of the Godhead. So, we're, so first of all, we know there's a Godhead. Now let's look at the scriptures, and we're going to go into the Old Testament. Throughout that, looking at many scriptures tonight. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. We see a revelation right off the bat in the first verse in Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. When we look at the word God, it is the word Elohim. Elohim is the plural form of God. It's not singular. It is plural. That is important. In fact, we can see this is the word, this is the Westminster Hebrew more Old Testament morphology that shows all this. This is the word for God, Elohim, and it is plural. Well, that tells us right off the bat, there's a plurality of God a plurality of the Godhead. Well, that's important to understand. When we look at this word Elohim, by the way, let's look at the usage. 2,606 times. 2,346 times it's God referring to the, the true and living God with a capital G. And then all these other uses. One erroneously angels, remember, that's wrong. We're not lower than the angels. We're a little lower than the Godhead. So here we see this is the used all these times. And it's the plural word. So 2,346 times Elohim, meaning the plurality of God, is used throughout. Now, does that mean, well, how do we know that, that's, that there, there couldn't be another word that could be used? Well, let's look over at Deuteronomy chapter 32, and we pick up in verse 15. Here it speaks about, and it uses the word God, where it says, Then he forsook God, which made him, and lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. Notice when I put the cursor over the word God, it's a different word below. The other one, Elohim was number 430, 0430 in Strong's Concordance. This is a different one, 0433. It is the word Eloah. That is different. Eloah is the singular form for God. We see this when we look down here, and we see this is the word for God, Eloah, and notice it is singular. So that means there is a singular form for God. How about this word, the number of uses? And it's only used 57 times. 
52 times God refer with a capital G referring to the true God. Well, we got, what, 2,346 times, what did we say? It's, it's used the word, the plurality form, and only 52 times this one? <laughs> well, certainly if it meant that God was a singular one, it would use the word Eloah. But it doesn't use that. So we can't ignore that. It uses the word Elohim, which is the plural form of God. We see one place over in Psalms, chapter 18, verse 31. Who is God? Eloah, singular form. Save the Lord. And who is a rock? Save our Elohim God. This time it uses number 430, Elohim. So both of them are referred to. Sometimes it does refer to God as singular, but as we saw 2,346 times, it refers to God in the plurality of the Godhead. That means that we must understand it's not just, he's not singular, otherwise it would be Eloah all the time. There are places where Elohim, you might say, well, it's always translated God in all these different ones. No, it's not always translated that. There's places where Elohim is translated gods. We see in Exodus chapter 20, we pick up in verse 3. Thou shalt have no other gods, Elohim, notice below, before me. Well, there it's translated plural, which is referring to no other gods, and this would, of course, refer to all other false gods, but it is translated that way. Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 2. He said unto them, I'm 120 years old this day, I can no more go out and come in. Also the Lord hath said to me, Thou shalt not go over this Jordan here. That's not the one. I must have mistyped that. <laughs> it's about going after other gods. I wonder where it is. Mm. I'm sorry. I mistyped that one. It's not the right one. I'll find it another time. We also see that there's 190 verses where there are verses, verses that say God, plural, and God's plural. Let's look at some of those. Genesis chapter 3 over in verse 5. For God, Elohim, here, it's God's, it's plural, knows that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and you shall be as God's Elohim, knowing good and evil. It uses the same one. Leviticus, chapter 19, verse 4. Turn ye not unto idols, make to yourself molten gods, Elohim. I am the Lord your Elohim God. So there's false gods, but there's also God. But again, it uses the same thing, the plural form. And we'll, we'll look at several of these just so you can see. There, just, there aren't just a few of these. There's a whole 190 verses that refer to these kind of things. Deuteronomy 7.16. It shall consume all the people which the Lord thy God shall deliver thee. And thine eyes shall have no pity upon them, neither shall they serve their gods, Elohim, in both cases. Many times we see this brought forth. 190 verses in the Word of God. So if God is a plurality, we see this, why have the Jews not believed that? Why have they believed that he is only a singular God? Because they have believed that Elohim really should be singular as far as understanding, even though it's a plural form of God. Why would they think that? Well, we go back to Genesis chapter 1 and we can see why. In the beginning, God created. God is Elohim. And then we see the verb after that, created. Well, we have to look at this in the Hebrew. In the beginning, created, and here's the word for God. God is plural. Is created plural? You would think if it would line up with it. 
No, it's singular. Well, if we have a word God followed by a singular one, it must mean that really it means that he's singular God. That's how they come up with that. And you see that time and time again, because it's, God is often most followed by a singular verb. That's how they come up with this and think this. But there are places in the Old Testament where Elohim is used of the true God and followed by a plural verb. Well, that would kind of destroy their belief. See, they obviously have not done due diligence to look at this. Genesis chapter 20, verse 13. It came to pass when God, Elohim, caused me to wander from my father's house. This is this word ta'ah, and let's take a look at this. We come down here, and we see this is the word for God, Elohim. Then we come down to, this is that word for, is that the one for it? No, oh, that caused me to wonder, I'm sorry. It's ta'ah, which is this word here. Or to err, caused me to wander. Notice, it's plural. Well, that's a time when God, Elohim, plural, is followed by a plural verb. Well, that kind of destroys their belief that it's always going to be a singular verb behind it. No, it is plural in this case. And it's not just an isolated one. Here's another one. In Genesis chapter 35, Verse 7, here he built an altar and called the place Eth Bethel, because there God, Elohim, appeared unto him. This is this word galah, and let's look at this. I have to find this one. Here's the word for Elohim, and here, here's the word for to find it. Galah. This is the one, I think. That, that, that one's Galah. I'm trying to remember. Yeah, appeared. Elohim. And that's the word Galah. <clears throat> and it it's means that, we'll look at this for a moment, it's singular. <clears throat> That can't be it, it's plural. Let me see if I can find it. Um, that's Galah, I'm sorry. This is the one, because remember it says he, he appeared or uncovered means, or this also means revealed or appeared. This is the one. Notice that it's plural. It's also plural. So what does that tell us? That tells us that God, plurality, followed by a plural verb. Here's another case. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 23. When one nation on the earth is like the people, even like Israel, whom God went to redeem. God is again Elohim, plural. The word went is this word halak, which means to go or walk or come normally. And let's find that one. So you can show you this. Here we see, <clears throat> this is Elohim down here. And this is the word halak. Notice it's go or come or walk. And it's plural as well. So that's a third case where we've seen plurality God, plurality verb. Well, that makes you think he must be a plurality. And there's another one over in Psalms, Psalms 58. And we're taking the time to show you this so you can see that why haven't, why didn't the Jews discover this? Why didn't they look at this? So that a man shall say there is a reward for the righteous, verily he is a God that judgeth in the earth. God, Elohim, plurality, and then the word judge. 
here we see, this is the word for judge right here. The word judge is plural. Again, the plurality of the Godhead. And here's the word for God, plural. So God, judge, plurality. So here we got four different cases where we see a plural word for God, of course, Elohim, which it is, and then we see a plural verb following it. Well, that pretty much destroys their belief that it's always followed by a singular, because it's not. That would also imply that there is a plurality of the Godhead. Now, there's another thing that we should look at. We need to go back to Genesis that would give us a clue as to the Godhead, if there is a Godhead, which we know there is. We've already seen the scripture on it. How about when man was made, we made uh, God form man? Look what it says. Genesis 1.26. God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion, and it goes on. Notice, let us. Well, that's a plural pronoun. He didn't say, let me. He said, let us make man in our image, plural pronoun, after our likeness. Hmm. And who's saying this? God is saying this. Elohim, the plurality of the Godhead. So that's the guy, one speaking for the Godhead. Now, some people might say, well, maybe it was just God singular and then the angels with them. Well, that could be a possibility, but not in the context. Let us, now that could be God and the angels, but then it says, in our image. Are angels in the same image as God? No, that, couldn't, that wouldn't line up, would it? After our likeness. Oh, the angels are not made after the likeness of God. So it can't be talking about God, singular, and a bunch of angels? No. It's talking about the Godhead, the plurality of the Godhead. Let us make him in our image, our likeness. No question about it right there. Here's another place in Genesis chapter 3, verse 22. We saw this. Or I guess we didn't see this. The Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us. The plurality of the Godhead. We see another one over in Genesis chapter 11. When God comes down to confound the language of the people. Genesis 11, 7. Let, go to let us go down and confound there confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. Well, that's the Godhead, not just one. That's all of them. And here's another place where we actually see one of the Godhead speaking regarding the whole group of the Godhead. It's over in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, so this is one person speaking, whom shall I send? That would be one person. And who will go for us. So one person of the Godhead is going to go for the whole Godhead, for us. And he says, here am I, send me. That shows us something. And think about it. Who's the one that was sent to accomplish the redemption? It was Jesus, who was what? The Word. The Word's the one who was sent and came. So here we see one person of the Godhead speaking Who's going to go for us? So the use of plural pronouns clearly indicates there's more than one person in the Godhead. That's for sure. Now, some people might try to think that this seems almost like a contradiction in a sense. Well, if you view it like he's only one, you might think that. But if you view it as the Godhead, one speaking for the group of the Godhead for us, it makes perfect sense because the Godhead is a plurality. This proves the plurality of it. There's also scriptures that we have to look at that are actual plural descriptions of God 
where there's plural nouns and adjectives that are used in speaking of God. Well, that would show something as well. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 1. Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. Now, if you look in every translation out there, they all translate it creator, singular. Young's trans translates it creators. He's the only one that does it. And just another reason why we have Young's up here, because he would trans things, probably translate things correctly. Well, we need to look and find. This is this word, para, and here it is, the word for create. I want you to notice it is plural. Plural. Now, the reason it has, it has the verb, the creole, and over here where it has the second person masculine singular, that's because it's talking about thy. That would be for your. That's why you have both of them. But the verb, which is what it's here, or, or the participle, which is what it is, thy creators, the ones who did the creating, is a participle. It's plural. So it should have been translated plural, creators. Young's is the only one who did it. The not rest of them didn't have any guts, I guess. Or they were in compromise, and didn't, create, didn't translate things correctly as they should. We see over in Joshua, chapter 24, and verse 19. Joshua said unto the people, You cannot serve the Lord, for he is a holy God. He's a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins. Here we see the adjective holy is plural because God is Elohim, the plural form, so we know that's plural. So holy, if it was just talking about a singular God, holy would have to be singular, wouldn't it? But let's look and see. This is the word kadosh. Can we find this one. Here is the word for God. And here is the word kadosh, which is, that means holy. Notice, it's an adjective. And what is it? It's plural. The adjective would match the noun. They're both plural. So this is essentially saying the holy gods because they're both plural. That's what it should be. And that's really what it says in the, in, in, in the Hebrew, literally. Here's another one. Over in Isaiah, chapter 54, verse 5. For thy maker is thine husband. Now, we told you about how Young's does a good job, but he didn't do a good job here because he translated it singular too. He did a good job on creators, but I don't know what happened to him on this one. He either compromised or didn't see it or didn't look it up properly or something. For the word maker is plural. This particular word, asa, as we will see, here it is. It's, this is the word asa. It is plural, your makers. Nobody translated it. They all translated singular. For thy makers, well, that's more than one, isn't it? That again speaks of the plurality of the Godhead. So we got the creators, we got the holy gods, plural, and we got the makers. Unfortunately, Young's didn't pick up on that. I don't know why he didn't. There's also scriptures that speak about God, God, no other God beside him. Let's look over here in Deuteronomy chapter 4. We look at verse 35. Remember, God is considered one, and we'll talk about how that works in a moment, yet there's a plurality of the Godhead we've already seen pretty clearly. Unto thee it was showed that thou mightest know that the Lord, He is God, Elohim, and there's none else beside Him, and that's singular there. Well, that's right. There is one 
but at the same time, the plurality God is one. And we will, you'll see this in a little bit when we show you the, how that works. Verse 39 again, Know therefore this day, consider it in thine heart, that the Lord, He is God in heaven above and upon the earth beneath. There's none else. And this is going to be singular over here. We see over in 2 Samuel, but it's talking about the plurality, God, Elohim. 2 Samuel 7, see there's no contradiction when you understand God is one. There's only one when you understand what one means. You will find it shortly. 2 Samuel 7, 22. Wherefore thou art great, O Lord God, there's none like thee. God, again, is the word Elohim. None like thee. Neither is there any God, Elohim, besides thee. And that's, again, those are in the singular. We see another case, Verse Chronicles 17, and it might look like it's a contradiction, or it looks, looks like it might destroy thinking that because there's no other God besides me, singular. Here we see, O Lord, there's none like thee, neither is there any God besides thee. So here we see the plural God, but it's referring to also besides thee in the singular, that he's one. There's also scriptures, this is quoted by the cults, they, they jump on these things, but they totally ignore everything else, of course. Isaiah chapter 43. In this whole passage, it's talking about the Lord thy God. I am the Lord thy God, Elohim, the Holy One of Israel. And it goes through it through and says many things in here. And you can't just take it out of context. He says, you're my witnesses, saith the Lord, my servant whom I have chosen. You may know and believe me and understand I am he. Before me there was no God form. And this is just a general word for God, the word El. Just El. That's the general word that just means God form. Neither shall be after me. But they take this to try to say there's only one God. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there's no Savior. Beside me, again, now this is singular here, but remember, what's the context talking about? The context is talking about I am the Lord, Elohim, thy God. So Elohim is the one who it's talking about here. Elohim we see there. There is no contradiction when you understand that God is one. There is none besides Him as far as one, but yet He's a plurality of the Godhead. Now, how can we understand this oneness or this me or this one singular aspect of God in a sense? It's understanding what one really means and why we call it the triunity of the Godhead not the Trinity, because it's not three different gods. That's error. And because of that, that's why we have confusion. The body of Christ has not called it correctly. They've in, incorrectly called it the Trinity. Never call it the Trinity. After you fin hear this tonight, you'll never say it again, unless you're referring to three false gods. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Look what it says. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. I want you to notice this word, one. It is the word ekkad. Ekkad. Ekkad is an important word to look at because ekkad means a united one, not a singular one. In fact, we should look at this. Even the Strongs will even show this this is Strong's Concordance, reproduced here in this Lightning Bible program. And this is the word Echad, number 259. And notice this, properly united one. A united one, well that could be several things united together to be one. And that's what you find the word akkad means. It's not an absolute singular one. It is a united one. And we're going to prove that from the scriptures very clearly beyond a shadow of a doubt. 
That's what it's talking about. The Lord our God is one united Lord. Elohim again, the plurality form, which remember they already wrote that off and decided that was just means really singular, even though it's in the plural form. <laughs> you can't do that, but that's what they've done. Well, let's look at all this. We're going to look in here many scriptures. Genesis 1, verse 5. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the echad day. First, it can be translated first. Something is translated once, remember, six, whoops, 687 times, and first, 36 times. Because it's referring to something that's a united one. It depends on the context. In this case, the evening and the morning were the echad, united one, first day. Why would that be? Because you have the evening and you have the morning, two parts of the day, and they are called the Echad day. That is a united one or a compound one. Let's look at another case, Genesis 2, 24. Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, even shall be called woman because she was taken out of man, and then we come to verse 24, therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. So we got a man, and we got a woman. A woman. There's two persons, right? Notice, he, she's go, he's going to cleave unto his wife, and they, the two of them, plural, shall be one flesh. Is the man and the woman now the same person? Only one person? No, they're a united one, aren't they? They're united together. That's the word echad. They become a united one. The two become one. We see over in Genesis uh, chapter 34, verse 16. Then will we, plural, give our daughters unto you, and we will take your daughters to us, and we will dwell with you, all these plural um, pronouns, and, and we will become, that's the whole group, one people, a cod. Well, what's that talking about? We got the we, given our daughters, and we take your daughters to us, we dwell with you, we will become, all of them together become what? One united people. They didn't all become the same person. No, they're a united people. They're a combined unity, is what it is, of the people. That is what the word akkad means here. Here's another place of verse 22. Only herein will the men consent unto us for to dwell with us to be one people. Us and us, plural, plural, plural group of people that become now a united one people. Ah, we got one, but we have several people combined in this one. Let's look at another case where it uses the word akkad. Numbers 13, verse 23. They came into the brook of Eshcol and cut down from thence a branch with one cluster of grapes and they bear it between two upon a staff, and they brought of the pomegranates and of the figs. One echad cluster of grapes. We got one cluster. Does that mean there's only one grape? No. There's a whole lot of grapes that made up the one cluster. It's a united one, isn't it? Of many grapes together that form a cluster. Let's look at another case. Judges, chapter 20. The verse 11. So all the men, plural, of Israel, were gathered against the city. Well, that's a whole lot of men. Knit together as one man. Echad. So they were all together as one united man, the whole group, but it was a whole bunch of men. They were plural. So the many men knit together as one united man. Again, we see the compound unity here of all these men together declared as one united man. Here's another case. And we're taking the time to look at this because 
we, can, we just can't, aren't going to take a couple scriptures here or there. We've got to drive this point home. 2 Samuel 2.25 The children of Benjamin gathered themselves together after Abner and became one Echad troop. You can see it below. and stood on the top of the hill. The children, that's a whole bunch of them. They become one troop. What are they? The group is a united one. We see another place over in Ezra, chapter 2, verse 64. The whole congregation together was 40 and 2,303 score. Um, we got 42,360. That's, that's a whole bunch of different people. What are they? They are the whole congregation here it's talking about. Together, Echad. Aha. So it's talking about the whole group as one, a united one. We got all these ones together. Then we see in chapter 3 another use of it. In one, when the seventh month was come and the children of Israel were in the cities, the people gathered themselves, plural, together, as what? One Echad man to Jerusalem. So we see it again. We have all these ones united as a united man. And here's another good one over in Ezekiel. And we see, we've seen many of these. And this one really is a striking example because it just doesn't talk about men. Look what it talks about. Ezekiel 37, verse 16 and 17. Moreover, thou son of man, take thee one echad stick, write upon it, for Judah and for the children of Israel's companions. Then take another echad stick and write upon it, for Joseph the stick of Ephraim and all the house of Israel's companions. And join them one echad to another into one echad stick. Well, we join them all together, they become one, several sticks. And they shall become one echad in thine hand. <laughs> this thing's used, what, six times so or so here? We see the word echad used, where we see the sticks combined to become one, a compound one. Now, in light of all that, is there a Hebrew word that means an absolute one? Instead of echad, you could say, well, echad means one, you know. Well, if there's a word that does mean a absolute only one, why wasn't it used all the time? Well, there is one. Here's an example of it. Genesis 22, verse 2. He said, take now thy son, thine only son. This is the word yakid. Aha, that. Remember, the other one was the word, it was a compound unity. This is a singular one. This is the word yakid for only one. Only one, as it talks about, it's translated only. Thine only son, Isaac. And we see it in verse 16 again. He said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thine only yakid son. Well, Yaquid son. That shows us the fact that there is a word that is an absolute unity that could have been used all along, and it's not, it's not, it's not used at all, referred to him. So in Deuteronomy 6, 4, if it was really referring to there's only absolutely one, only one God, why didn't they use Yaquid? In Deuteronomy 6, 4, this is their great confession. Why? Because it's not Yaquid. It's a cod, a compound unity of the Godhead. There are scriptures that reveal in the Old Testament the Godhead comprised of at least two persons. Here's an example. Psalms 45, verse 6. Thy throne, O God, Elohim, is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is a righteous right scepter. Thou lovest righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, Elohim, thy 
Elohim, God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. So here we see in verse 6, we got one person. Verse 6, one person of the Godhead. He's speaking to another person of the Godhead, and he's calling him at thy throne, O God. He's calling him God, Elohim, one of the persons of the Godhead. And then in verse 7, we see here the one uh, person of the Godhead. He's anointed and enthroned another person of the Godhead. God, thy God, has anointed thee, because he called him God. And of course, this is quoted over in the New Testament, in Hebrews, because this is when Jesus was inaugurated as the King of kings and Lord of lords and enthroned in heaven. Look what it says. It says a little differently. Verse 8, unto the Son he saith, well, who's doing the talking? The Father. And what does he say to the Son? Thy throne, O God, he calls Jesus the Son God here. Anybody that tries to say that, well, Jesus isn't God, yeah, it shows it right here. The Father called him God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness, hated iniquity, therefore God. Even thy God, talking about the Father, has anointed thee with the oil of gladness. So this is referring to God, the Father, and this is referring to God calling the Son God. Now they're both God, aren't they? They're both God, God in the part of the Godhead, persons of, of the Godhead in as God. Let's go back to the Old Testament and we'll look at another place where we see this. Hosea chapter 1, verse 7. I will have mercy upon the house of Judah and will save them the Lord, by the Lord their God. So I, that's one person of the Godhead speaking. He says he's going to have mercy on the house of Ju Judah and will save them by the Lord their God. Well, that wouldn't make sense. I am going to save them by the Lord their God if I'm doing the thing. He's talking about another person of the Godhead. I am going to save them by the Lord their God. Well, that's Jehovah, which is the compound, co co the covenant making, the covenant name of the Lord, Elohim. So this is talking about one person of the Godhead saying, I'm going to save them by another person of the Godhead. We see another case over in Genesis chapter 19, verse 24. Look what it says. Then the Lord... Well, that would be one of the Godhead, rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah, brimstone and fire, where? From the Lord out of heaven. Let's talk about two different ones in the Godhead. The Lord rained it from who? From the Lord out of heaven. Well, this must refer to the Lord, it could very well be the Holy Spirit who was down on the earth, raining upon, doing the, carrying this out. And where? It was from the Lord, which, where, where's this one at? This is the ones in heaven. Again, talking about two persons of the Godhead. Let's look at another case over in Zechariah. In Zechariah chapter 2, we pick up in verse 8. Here it says, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, so this is one person of the Godhead speaking, after the glory hath he sent me unto the nations which spoiled you, for he that toucheth you toucheth the apple of his eye. For behold, I will shake my hand upon them. This is the one speaking. They shall be a spoil to their servants, and you shall know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me. Now wait a minute. This is the one, the I, who's coming, and he's the same as the me. But wait a minute. The Lord of hosts sent me, the I, who's going to shake them. Well, now we got two people of the Godhead, don't we? We got the me, which is the I, which is God, the one who is going to be saying he's going to be sent. And who sent him? The Lord of hosts sent him. That's another person of the Godhead. So we can see again, we have two persons of the Godhead. There's one place where we see the three persons of the Godhead actually revealed in, in the, what is expressed in the verse, when you look at it carefully. Isaiah 
chapter 48. We pick up over here in verse 16. Come ye near unto me. This is one person of the Godhead speaking, me. Hear ye this, I, this same person, have not spoken in secret from the beginning, from the time that it was. There am I, same person, and now the Lord God, talking about somebody else, and His Spirit, somebody else, has sent me, referring to this first one. Well, we got the Lord God, that's one person the Godhead, and we got His Spirit, the Holy Spirit, sent me. Now well, that would be a third person of the Godhead. The three persons of the Godhead are shown here. Now one of the verses that people use to try to claim that Jesus is the only one and that he's just the, he has all these titles and that there isn't a separation between the Father being a person and Jesus being a person. And this is the scripture that they like to grab hold of. Well, let's look at this for a moment here. Isaiah 9, 6. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, L, just a general word for God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Well, who's the one who's the Prince of Peace? That's Jesus. Who is the child? Jesus. He got born. He's what? The Son. And the government, the rule and reigns upon his shoulders, this is all talking about Jesus, isn't it? In his name, this is referring to Jesus. Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God. And they say, well, wait a minute. He just has a different title here. It's the same Jesus, the Everlasting Father. So they say, well, the Father is Jesus. Because it says he's the Everlasting Father here. Well, that is a mistake. Because when we look at this word, this word simply means perpetuity, someone who continues in the future, and it's talking about the father of and somebody, and that's why Young translates it the father of eternity. Not talking about he's the everlasting father. Instead, he's the father of eternity, because what did Jesus do? He made it for, uh, for us to have everlasting life. It's not talking about he's the Father himself. This is talking about all the things that he, what he produced, which he produced here, the everlasting eternal life for us. That's why it should be translated, and other people have translated it this way as well. Young's translated it this way. Wilson's Old Testament word studies translates this phrase, the Father of eternity the same way. The emphasized Bible by Rotherham's, I don't know if that's up here or not. Do I have that one? Well, here's Darby's, by the way. Darby translates it the father of eternity, better translation. Even the Dewey Rames translates it the father of the world to come. And that's the one that's the Catholic one. This is, this is it here. The father of the world to come, otherwise of the, what's the future of eternity. Not talking about that he is the father, but the father who brought this forth, the father of eternity in the future. That is what it's talking about. The, ever, the uh, uh, emphasized Bible by Rotherham, it translate the father of futurity futurity. So this is what it really means in the Hebrew. It's referring to the Father of Eternity, not saying that he's, quote, the person or, let's say, a title, the Father. That is a great mistake. Now, people tried to make some case out of that, and yet that's not so at all. We see the Father being a different person time after time after time in the New Testament, which we'll begin to look at. So, we can see from this. What have we seen? We've seen the fact that we, there's the plurality of the name God, not here, but in the other cases. We go back even to Genesis chapter 1. God is the plural form. We see that here it was a singular verb, but there's other places where you had 
plural verbs. We see there's places where God is referred to in the plural and holy gods. We saw creators. We saw makers. We saw many cases that shows he's the Godhead, that there's a plurality of the Godhead. And furthermore, we saw what it means to be one. One's not an absolute one. It's not an only one. It's an echad, united one. We saw it time after time after time. This proves the fact that we're talking about the plurality of the Godhead. Why they didn't do their due diligence and find this out, it's beyond me. Why Christians haven't done the same thing or why these cults have done it, who knows. If they did their due diligence, they would see this. If they looked at it, they saw, see the plural verbs and the plural nouns for creators and makers, these kind of things. What a mistake. So this is why they're, they're blinded. They have believed a lie. You know, when you're deceived, you'll get deceived and deceiving spirits will come into you. And so they believe this. The Jews have missed it. It's the Godhead. And why we try it, the tri, call it the triunity is because they are one in unity, a united one. The triunity of the Godhead. Now let's begin to look just for a few minutes here in the New Testament. Because the New Testament reveals this as well. We see many references here. We'll look at, first of all, is God the, fa is the Father God? And is Jesus God? And is the Holy Spirit God? Are there scriptures that say specifically they're God? Yeah, there are. There's lots of them about the God the Father. They're all over the place. Here's just one example. Galatians 1.3, grace to you and peace from God the Father. We see this referred to God the Father many times in the New Testament. Well, the Father is God, and he's, got, he's a person. He's not some title. He's not some manifestation. He is a person. And from our Lord Jesus Christ, that talks about two different people. Well, do we see Jesus being declared to be God? Yeah, the scripture we already looked at, but let's look at it again to see it. This is the Father speaking to the Son, and that's Jesus. Under the Son, he saith, Thy throne, O God. The Father called Jesus God. Well, that means he is God as well. How about the Holy Spirit? Is the Holy Spirit referred to as God? Yeah, he is. Acts chapter 5, verse 3. This is where Ananias was... Peter called him on the carpet for what he'd done, of course, and remember he'd kept back the price and, with his wife, and they were lying. Acts 5.3, notice what it says. Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? So they were lying specifically to the Holy Spirit and to keep back part of the price of the land. But what's the next verse say? While well, it remained, was it not thine own? If it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. Well, wait a minute. Who did he say he lied to? He lied to the Holy Spirit. And the next verse says, he lied to God. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is God. In the context, the Holy Spirit is who that's referring to, and he is God. All three are referred to as God. They are the three separate persons in the Godhead. Let's look at some scriptures that reveal the three persons of the Godhead. Matthew chapter 3, verse 16. Jesus, there he is in the person. He's in, has, the word was flesh, a person with a body. When he was baptized, straightway, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. Well, that's somebody else. That's the Holy Spirit. So now we got Jesus, that's one person, and we got the Holy Spirit, a second person. And then we come to verse 17, and lo, a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Well, who would be saying that? The Father. The Father declares He's the Son. And where is, what is this? This is coming from heaven, a different place. And is it just some title? 
announcing something? No. It is a voice. Titles don't have a voice. Who has a voice? A person. This is a person from heaven, this, I, which we know is the Father, because he says, it's my beloved Son. So in the context, what do we see? We see Jesus in the person. We see the Spirit of God coming from the heavens, opened up and descending down. And we hear a voice that's still up in heaven, the Father speaking. So we have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We see over in Matthew 28, verse 19, and talking about the baptism here. When you make disciples, Matthew 28, 19, go you therefore and teach, miss not a good word. It's the word to be a disciple, to make a disciple of one. Who, may, who becomes a disciple? One who's born again. So this is talking about Christians who are born again throughout all these nations. Make disciples, he said, of all nations. And disciples are those that are hearing and doing the word and fruitful. Baptizing them actively, remember, into the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Ghost. Now, is this talking about one person with three different titles? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. One of the ways you know is by looking at the Greek and the fact that whenever you see a person identified, it will have a definite article before it. Look what it says here. Into the, that's a definite article, this is the word for name, onoma, that's accusative, so that's the noun, direct object. And now we have three genitives after that that would be translated of, the name of. Notice, the definite article, father. And, that's chi, means and. The, another definite article, son. And, the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, there's a the between each one. It didn't say in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, or the name of Father and Son and Holy Spirit. No, it makes it very clear. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and whenever that's there, that means these are all different, different per persons or different things, if you're talking about things, because it has a definite article before them. So again, this is talking about the three persons of the Godhead the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let's look at another one. Luke chapter 1, verse 35. The angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, one person of the Godhead, the power of the highest, who's the highest? The Father shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Uh, a child, so something's coming into you and he'll be born of you. This is talking about the power of the highest, referring to the Father. The Holy Spirit is the one who's going to come upon specifically her and what's going to be planted in her to be born, the Son of God, referring to the three persons of the Godhead. We see another case over in Romans chapter 15, verse 30. Now I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake and for the love of the Spirit that you strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. Who do we pray to? We pray to the Father, don't we? We don't pray to Jesus. And so who's it talking about when it says pray to God? It's talking about God the Father. But it's also talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's talking about here the love of the Spirit. The Spirit here again would be referring to the three persons of the Godhead. Here's another case, and we went over this when we talked about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, how the Godhead, all three, are involved in the gifts of the Spirit operation. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 4. There's diversities or di distribution differences of gifts, but the same Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit. There are differences of administrations, the way this thing is administered, but the same Lord. 
Well, the, the Holy Spirit's not Lord. Who's Lord? Jesus is. He's involved in it. There are diversities of operations, but it's the same God which worketh all in all. Who's this referring to? The Father. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all involved in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We see another case. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. We got the Lord Jesus Christ, when he's been called God, remember. We got the love of God referring to the Father. And then we got the communion or fellowship of the Holy Spirit, the three persons of the Godhead. These aren't all titles or manifestations of him. No, these are three persons. All of these are persons. We also see in 1 Peter 1, verse 2, Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Again, the three persons of the Godhead. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. Christ, one person of the Godhead, also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. He brought us to be to God, to be reconciled to the Father, being put to death on the flesh, but quickened or made alive by the Spirit. Who raised him from the dead? The Holy Spirit is the one that raised him. So here we see again the three persons of the Godhead. Here's 1 John 5, 7. Some people try to say you can't use that verse because it's not in very many trans, many the manuscripts on it, and that's true. It, but nonetheless, because those manuscripts were gone, they were destroyed, nonetheless they're in the earlier Bibles, and they just didn't pull it out of the air, thin air. There is definitely substantiation that this should be in the Word of God. This is why they italicize this. There are three that bear record in heaven. And they are. Who are they? The Father, the Word. Is there any other place where Jesus is called the Word to confirm this? No, well, there sure is. We'll, get, we'll show you in a moment. And the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. That's why we have the one Godhead, but we have the three persons of the Godhead. These three are one. Do we see any other place where it could refer? Who is the Word? I thought the Word was just the Word of God. No, the word is referred to as Jesus, remember, when it says the word was made flesh. And who's that? That's Jesus. Dwelled among us, beheld his glory, the glory is of the only begotten of the Father. Here's two persons of the Godhead right there. Jesus, the word, becomes flesh, and the Father is the one who had sent him, and he's up in heaven. Let's look over at Jude, verse 20. Ye beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. That's one person of the Godhead. Verse 21, keep yourselves in the love of God, talking about the Father, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life, the third person of the Godhead. Now we see these three persons of the Godhead. They're one in unity and relationship but they have different functions. They're different persons carrying out the different separate functions of the Godhead, and that's important. Look at uh, another scripture here that even shows that they're all over the place in the New Testament. Matthew 10, verse 32. Whosoever therefore shall confess me, Jesus is speaking, before men, which is the word, him will I confess also before my Father, which is in heaven. Jesus is here speaking on earth, and he's referring to, he's going to confess it before my Father, which is in heaven. Two persons of the Godhead. And then it even says, if you deny me before men, him will I deny before my Father, which is in heaven. We will be denied before him. There are many scriptures, and we're going to be going through those on Wednesday night because we're not going to have enough time to go through all of these. But I wanted to point out a couple things. 
In John chapter 10, this is one that is a favorite one of people who try to say Jesus and the Father are the same person. Look what they say. John 10, verse 30. I and my Father, my is stuck in there, the, I, this is the word I, and, this is Kai, the, referring to a person, a definite article, Father, are, this is the verb, and this is the word meaning one. So it does literally say, I and the Father are one. That's right. Does that mean they're the same person? But people, especially of the, the oneness Pentecostal group, they'll say, they'll bring this scripture to you right away. Well, the Bible says, I and the Father are one. That means they're the same person. Since when does one mean you're the same? It doesn't mean that. The man and the woman are one. Are they the same? No. They're a united one, aren't they? We saw that time and time again. I and the Father, are they the same person? We've already seen it time after time after time. The Father's in heaven, a voice speaks, Jesus is there. Uh, they're not the same person. And when he's being baptized, we saw it time after time after time. They're not. In fact, if we go back a voice for a verse, he says, My Father, Jesus speaking about a person, which gave them me is greater than all. Well, that means he's greater than the other persons in the Godhead, which is true in the chain of command. And no man's able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. He's talking about the Father. And then he says, I and my Father are one. That's right, they are one in the Godhead, but they do have different functions. And in the chain of command, the Father is greater than Jesus and the Holy Spirit. That is important to understand. They have different functions. The Father's greater in the divine chain of command in the Godhead. Now also, people that say, well, my Father, that means we're still one. I'm still going to believe they're the same person. Well, let's come down here and look at another place where he talks about them being one. John 17, verse 21. And he's talking here, it's the high priestly prayer. He's praying for all the ones who believe. Neither pray I for these alone, but also for those that believe on me through their words. So it's talking about all the believers over time. That they, all the believers, may be one. Are all the believers the same person? No. What are they? They're a united one, aren't they? They're not all the same. When you say one, that doesn't mean we're the same person. As thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that's right, they're united in one, that they also may be one in us. Well, us shows, well, that's a plural pronoun. That kind of destroys the same person thing, doesn't it? Because we're talking about us. That's two different persons, isn't it? And it's talking about all of us, the believers, may be one in us. Are we all the same person? You're not going to be a person anymore. We're all going to be the same person. That's insane. People throwing their minds out the window that come up with this stuff. It's amazing. That may seem a little rough, but I think they lost their minds. It's pretty clear that they, that's a plural, may be one, and now we're the same person, in us, another plural. No, they're talking about we're all united as one together with him. Amazing that people will come up with this stuff. It's astounding. Now, I want to, we'll cover more on Wednesday. We'll go through a lot. But I want to discuss understanding this Godhead and the chain of command. There's three persons in the Godhead we saw it in the Old Testament. We saw it in the New Testament. The Father, he's identified as the Father in the New Testament. The Son, who is Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. In fact, before we do this, let's look at one other scripture I thought I'd just show you real quick. One of the things we know that these ones that try to say it's Jesus and he's manifest in these different titles, different manifestations, it's ridiculous. 
John 16, 23, look what Jesus says. This is Jesus speaking. In that day, talking about the day of the New Testament, you shall ask me, well, that's talking about to Jesus, nothing. So do we pray to Jesus? No. Well, if he's the person, why would we be told not to pray to him? <laughs> verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever you shall ask the Father, well, they think the Father's a title. Am I going to go ask a title for something? No. God is a person. He's a Godhead with three persons. The Father is a person. The Son is a person. And the Holy Spirit is a person. We're going to ask the Father in my name. Well, that's in Jesus' name. We're talking about two people right there. And who's going to give it to you? Well, Jesus is going to give it to me. No. He is the Father. He the one I'm praying to, the Father, will give it you. Again, this shows the two persons of the Godhead, and we don't pray to Jesus. He even said it out of his own mouth. You pray to the Father. Well, that's a different person. In my name, meaning, well, that's the person of Jesus. Why in his name? Because he's in the high priestly ministry at the right hand of the Father. That's why we pray in the name of Jesus. So there's three persons in the Godhead. Because they're one in unity, you would call it the triunity of the Godhead. Not a trinity, which means three gods. Don't ever call it trinity, it's a lie. All these people that have said this, which is almost the entire Christian world. Trinity's not even in the Bible. I say, give me chapter and verse for trinity. Oh, they look and look and look, it's not there. <laughs> So where would you get that word from? Well, they pulled it out themselves. Nothing to prove it whatsoever. We see the unity, the one, the united one, where why, why we would say a, a tri-unity, the three in unity in one. It's a description of that. So the three persons are one in unity. They're in each other as to relationship. We see, we saw it. The Father's in the Son, and the Son's in the Father. We see, saw scriptures all about that. The persons of the Godhead are with each other as to fellowship. Even us, we are, have fellowship with them. Look what it says in 1 John 1, 3 as an example. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto that we, you also may have fellowship with us. Truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. There is fellowship between the Father, the Son, the Godhead, and also with us. In the chain of command, it goes from God the Father to God the Son to God the Holy Spirit. That is important. God the Father has the, he's the top in the chain of command. And to show you that there's different persons for sure, Acts 1, 7. This is where they were saying, hey, you're going to restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, it's not for you to know the times of the seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, exousia. Well, that's a talk about a per different person, isn't it? That's not talking about the same person. And here we see the same thing. Here we see Jesus taking it from you into heaven. He's going to come in the like manner. We see also the fact that does Jesus know the time when he's coming back? Specifically, no, he doesn't know the time when he's coming back. Only the Father knows that time when he's coming back. Let's look at that a scripture on that. In, uh, these are ones we're going to look at later, but we'll look at some of these now, if I can find where they exactly are. It's the Father who's one who knows all these things that are in His possession. It's in, um, where am I? I think it's in Matthew. Um, we can hunt, hunt around for it. Matthew, or no, it's a, is it Matthew 24? 
where it talks about that. Jesus doesn't know the exact time. Be ready, in such an hour you think not the Son of Man cometh. And the Father is the one, I'll get that for you on Wednesday when we go through that. He's the one who knows the exact time, and Jesus does not know the exact time when he's going to be coming back. We'll, show, we'll go through that on, when we cover that on uh, uh, Wednesday. And you'll see that that tells us something. The Father must be one person and Jesus must be another because he doesn't know the actual hour when he's coming back, the day or the hour. Jesus does not know that. We also see the fact that in the Godhead command, Acts chapter 2, verse 33, reveals this. Therefore, be in the right hand of God exalted, that's Jesus, having received of the Father, he got it from the Father, the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this which you now see and hear. The Father gave the Holy Spirit to Jesus, who then sent the Holy Spirit into the earth. The chain of command goes from the Father to the Son to the Holy Spirit. That's the way it works. So it's very clear that we have three persons of the Godhead. And we'll go through many New Testament scriptures on Wednesday and show you this after we review some things. So the bottom line is this. It's the triunity of the Godhead. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are three separate persons. They're never identical as the person. They're in unity as one in the Godhead. They're in each other as the relationship. They're with each other as the fellowship. Each carries out his function in the Godhead. Clearly, we could see that in the gifts of the Spirit, where it talked about the same Spirit, and then it talked about the administration of it by the Lord, and we talked the operations coming from the Father. And the chain of command comes from the Father to the Son to the Holy Spirit. Clearly, we see there are three persons of the Godhead. Why the Jews have not discovered this? They obviously didn't look at all these scriptures and see the plurality of those words that we looked at. And a cod being a united compound one, a unity, not an absolute unity. And we also see these ones that in the New Testament that have thought that there's only one. This is the lie of what was called modalism back in the early days, which was discarded and rejected by the early church, anybody that believed it was a oneness. Yet we have people today who believe this oneness. They're a cult. They're in trouble. I'll even show you a scripture that even says why they're in trouble. If you don't believe the Father and Jesus are separate persons, then you don't have the Father and the Son. Look what it says in 2 John, verse 9. Whosoever transgresses and abides not in the doctrine of Christ has not God. They're not having God. they got a religious form. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he has both the Father and the Son. Actually, this shows the two persons. Because what does both refer to? Two things, right? If I say both, I'm referring to two separate things, the, both the Father and the Son, two different persons. Well, if these people, they don't believe that the Father and the Son are two different pe people, that means they don't have them. They're in trouble. In fact, they're not even having God according to the Word of God. This is important. We, cannot, we need to help people to come to the truth and people understand clearly the Godhead is revealed, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, I hope this has helped you from the Old Testament scriptures, and you can share this information with others. It's important for you when you come across a Jew, you come across uh, somebody who is from a cult, from these ones that say they deny that Jesus is God and they try to say there's just one God, or you come across these uh, misguided Christian organizations that believe in the oneness, especially the Pentecostals, uh, ones apostolic they refer them to usually. They're in error and they're in trouble because they're not believing 
that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are three separate persons. Say this with me. Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for the Word of God that brings clear revelation of the persons of the Godhead. I understand. They're not the Trinity, three separate gods. They are the Godhead. Three persons in the Godhead, the triunity of the Godhead. A united one is revealed in the Scripture. And the three persons are God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. I thank you for the revelation of the truth. And I understand how they're in each other as the relationship, with each other as the fellowship, each one carrying out a different function in the Godhead and the chain of command from the Father to the Son to the Holy Spirit is seen in the Scripture. Thank you for the truth. I will share this with others so they can come to the truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. We'll be covering more on Wednesday. We'll go through these New Testament Scriptures, and I'll get those Scriptures that show the ones where it talks about how Jesus doesn't know the day and the hour, and we'll look at those particular Scriptures as well, which obviously shows if He doesn't know it and somebody else knows it, there have got to be two different persons, right? No question about it. Father, thank you for the revelation you brought forth, clearly from the Old Testament and the New Testament, of the tri-unity of the three persons of the Godhead, who are one in unity, but they are three separate persons. Thank you, Father, for establishing us all in this truth, so we will not be deceived by any false doctrine, and also so we can share the truth with others to bring them out of error. Thank you, Father, for this understanding and also seeing the, the the functioning of the Godhead and the chain of command that exists. Father, we praise you for the revelation you're bringing in Jesus' name.